Good evening. About a fortnight ago, I made a hasty trip down to South Africa to have a look at the supernova in the large cloud of Magellan. And while there, I took a photograph of it with a 45 second exposure with a fixed camera, and there it is. That smudge near the centre of the picture is the large cloud of Magellan, unfortunately too far south to be seen from here. It's an independent galaxy about 155,000 light years away. And there, the bright star-like thing near the centre is the supernova, a colossal stellar explosion involving the death of a massive star. And here's a lovely picture taken at the Siding Spring Observatory by David Malin. That mass to the top left is the famous Tarantula Nebula, and there to the lower right is the supernova. Well, we think we know something about supernovae. There hasn't been one in our own galaxy since the year 1604. So this one is the next best thing, and you can see it quite clearly with the naked eye. And we think also we know the star that has produced it, a white giant star that has collapsed on itself and literally blown itself to pieces. But this is a very odd supernova. It doesn't seem to be conforming to the general pattern, and we're not quite sure what is happening at the moment. So when we do know, we'll come back and tell you. Something else very interesting has been discovered quite recently. And this is in the globular cluster we know as Messier 28, which is in the constellation of the Archer, about 15,000 light years away from us. And there's a picture of Messier 28. Of course, it's a negative, with the stars showing up as black against white. And there in the middle is the globular cluster, a huge symmetrical star system, not very far away from the edge of our main galaxy. And inside this, Andrew Lyon at Jodrell Bank, using the 250-foot radio telescope there, has discovered a millisecond pulsar. Now, pulsars appear to be supernova remnants. When a supernova outburst occurs, all that's left is a very small, super-dense thing made up of neutrons spinning around very rapidly and sending out pulsed radio waves, hence the name pulsar. And many of these are now known. But this one is an oddity. It spins around something like 300 times a second. And we believe that these millisecond pulsars, and only four are known so far, are probably very old, and they've been speeded up by a former companion star that's no longer to be seen. So this is a really very exciting discovery. But George Old Bank itself has its 30th anniversary in the near future, and we're going to do a special program from there. So we'll bring you the latest news of the millisecond pulsar then. Meanwhile, I want to turn to something very much nearer home only about a quarter of a million miles away, and that is our familiar moon. Because you may have noticed in the last few months that the crescent moon sometimes appears exceptionally high up, and the full moon appears exceptionally low down, and there are reasons for that. But first of all, remember, the moon only shows part of its face to the Earth. There's a section of the moon we can never see from here because it's always turned away from us. And why is that? Now, the moon goes around the Earth in a period of 27.3 days. To be pedantic, the Earth and the Moon move together round their common centre of gravity, or barycentre, but that actually lies inside the Earth's globe, and so I feel that the simple statement that the Moon goes round the Earth is good enough for most purposes. Now, the Moon spins on its axis, not in 24 hours as we do, but in 27.3 days, exactly the same time it takes to go once round the Earth. And therefore, if you think about it, you'll realize that it always keeps the same face turned towards us, and there's an area of the moon we can never see from here. So that part of the moon, the hidden side, was totally unknown until 1959, when the Russians sent their unmanned probe, Lunik 3, on a round trip, and sent back pictures. And this, in fact, was a very first picture sent back, and I was doing a live Sky at Night program when it came through. I remember it very well, October 1959. Well, the Russians actually sent me a globe they'd made of the moon, and here is the side of the moon we know about, the familiar dark seas, which of course have never contained any water. And when they sent me this globe, this area was still blank. Was there nothing, there was nothing about that that was known at all. But this area here is alternately brought in and out of view. We call that the libration areas. And the Russians had actually used my own charts drawn from Earth to tie up the lunic pictures. Since then, of course, many craft have been around the moon, so have astronauts, and we now have full maps of both the near and the far sides of the moon. But before 1959, our knowledge was very much less. But to say more about the moon, how it moves and what's about it, I am delighted now to reintroduce one of our very valued friends on the sky at night, Dr. Ron Madison. Hello. Uh, yes, there are some subtle changes that take place in the motion of the moon, which you can't easily see, certainly not in one evening. 
And in order to see these properly, you've got to watch it systematically and keep very careful records. Uh, one thing that is very obvious, for example, is that as the moon moves in an elliptical orbit around the Earth, it changes its distance from the Earth in a systematic way. And this, pic this picture shows you the effect of two pictures taken with the same telescope and the same magnifying power, but two weeks apart. And you can see the opposite phases here. You can also see the different size of the moon. During that period, of course, the moon has moved further away at the extreme part of its orbit, and so it appears smaller on the left-hand side. And when it's nearer to us, it's larger on the right-hand side. That's a very simple effect to understand. But there is, of course, a much more subtle effect that's called the librational motion of the moon. And that's a complicated combination of motions that allow us, over a period of about 18 years, to see something like 59% of its surface. And there are two or three physical processes that give rise to that effect. But let's see what the effect is at first. These two pictures were taken something like nine years apart. You can see the phases are about the same. But if you look at the, for example, one of the large seas, the Mare Chrysium, on the left-hand side of each picture, about eight o'clock on the moon there, you'll see that on the left-hand picture, it's very close to the limb of the moon, whereas on the right-hand side, it's quite substantially far in. And if you compare the two pictures by overlapping them, you can see that various features on the moon change their position. This is because there is a sort of uh, nodding and swaying motion of the moon, which is called the librational motion. It comes from the word librational, meaning slightly oscillating balance. And that's precisely the situation we find. If we try to understand what causes this effect, then uh, there's one effect, of course, one reason, which is very easy to understand. And that is the fact that we are standing on the surface of the Earth, which is rotating. If we watch the moon rising on our eastern horizon, this is the view we get from a point at the bottom of the Earth on that picture. But during 12 hours, the Earth rotates until we are on the far side of it, some 8,000 miles away from our starting point, and we get a view which is slightly different. We see a little bit around the left and right-hand sides of the moon, which allow us to build up an extra difference. That's called the diurnal or daily effect. And then there's another effect, which is very simple to understand. It's called the latitude effect in libration. And that's due to the fact that the moon's axis of rotation is tilted to the plane of its orbit. So that in this picture, we see uh, the axis tilted there, the north and south line drawn in. We are seeing from the Earth 150%, which allows us to see just beyond the North Pole, not quite as far as the South Pole in that position. But two weeks later, the moon has rotated until it's on the opposite side of the Earth. And when we look at the moon from that position, we see just beyond the southern pole, not quite as far as the northern pole. So we are seeing the nodding motion in that particular case. So that's the two effects. The third one is called the libration in longitude. And it's rather more difficult to understand, but uh, a rather beautiful effect. If we imagine that the orbit of the moon around the Earth is perfectly circular, we can see what happens with a perfectly synchronized system. That is, the axial rotation of the moon is exactly matched by the period in its orbit. In this position, we see 50% of the moon. 90 degrees later, we see that. It's the same 50%. 180 degrees, we see exactly the same 50%, and so on, until we've completed the orbit and not seen any more than 50%. But in reality, the moon moves in an elliptical orbit. And that means that it obeys Kepler's laws. And when the moon is closer to the Earth, it moves faster in its orbit. So that in this position, we're looking at a certain 50% of the moon. When the moon has rotated 90 degrees of its axial rotation, because of its extra speed, it's completed more than a quarter of its orbit. And so we see it in this situation from a slightly different angle. And we can see a little bit about the left-hand edge, as you see it on that diagram. The synchronizations got back in step by half an orbit's time. And by three quarters of an orbit's time, we're seeing the other side. Here, the moon has been moving slowly. The axial rotation has got ahead of it. And we see, again, the swaying motion. We've seen a little bit around the left and right-hand sides. So these three processes give rise to the librational effect, 59% in total. At least we do now have maps of the entire surface of the moon. Now let's turn on to uh, the tides. And after all, the moon is the main cause of the tides in our oceans. I quite agree that the sun also produces tides, but the sun, don't forget, is a great deal further away, 93 million miles, and the solar tides are not so strong as those due for the moon. When the sun and the moon are pulling in the same direction, 
we have stronger or spring tides, nothing to do with the season of spring, I may add. And when the sun and the moon are pulling at right angles, they are trying to counteract each other, and the tides are weaker, and we call those neap tides. But for the moment, let's forget all about the sun and concentrate entirely upon the tides due to the moon. And to make things easier, let's begin by assuming that the Earth is surrounded by a uniform shell of water. I know it's not, but let's imagine that. And therefore, the water on the moonward side of the Earth is going to be pulled up by the moon's gravity, and we're going to have a high tide. And there we see a plan view. N marks the north pole of the Earth. We're looking straight down at it, so to speak. But there's also a bulge of water on the far side. And why is that? Well, the reason is this. The water on the moonward side has the strongest lunar pull and is pulled up toward the moon. On the far side of the Earth, the water is further away from the moon and is being pulled less strongly. So the solid body of the Earth has the greater pull and is being pulled away from the water, so to speak. And that's why the moon produces two high tides on opposite sides of the Earth. But, Ron, that's not the entire story. No, indeed, that is a static view of something which is really in dynamic equilibrium. And what's happening here is, of course, the Earth, a very big object, is rotating very quickly on its axis once in 24 hours. And what actually happens here is that the tide-raising forces give rise to these bulges, but the rotation of the Earth carries the bulges around so that they no longer point towards the moon, the thing which is causing them in this case. And we get a situation where the axis, if you like, through the bulges, is inclined at an angle from the moon. What we see happening here is that the nearer bulge is exerting a stronger force than the further bulge. But here you see that we are doing what physicists like to do, and that is split those forces into components. We find that an angular force like this exerts a tiny little force on the moon along its orbit. But the same situation applies to the further bulge of the Earth's tidal bulge. That gives a force which is less strong, and the component along the orbit of the Moon is in the opposite direction from the first one, and slightly smaller. And the net result is that there's an unbalanced force acting on the Moon in the direction of its orbital motion. That causes it to move faster, to accelerate, and it, as a natural consequence, it moves into a bigger orbit. Of course, the moon is slightly, slowly receding from us. It's nothing we should get steamed up about, I think. It's about 3.2 centimetres a year. But nevertheless, over geological time, that builds up. And over a long period of time, of course, you realise that you can't get something for nothing. And whereas you're getting an accelerated moon, you wonder where the energy is coming from. And of course, it's coming from the Earth. What is happening is that the tidal drag of those bulges being dragged around is actually slowing down the rotation of the Earth so that the days are getting longer. And we don't have to look very far for evidence to support that view because if you talk to geologists, they will tell you about the fossil evidence we have of this effect. And I have here a little fossil which is a, a Silurian coral, actually from Dudley in the West Midlands, which was, of course, a living creature and it's deposited stone in this layered fashion. If you look at this picture, you'll see that there are layers where it's shown daily growth rings, as it were. And so by looking at the varying thicknesses of these uh, lines, these rings in the fossils, you can work out how many days there were in a year. And it's very clear that in the Silurian period, a few hundred million years ago, we're dealing with a year which was 450 days long. And there's been quite a substantial slowing down during that time. When we began this program, Ron, I said that the moon's been behaving in a rather unusual way, because sometimes the crescent moon can be extremely high up, and sometimes the full moon can be very low down. And at the present moment, the full moon appears to be very low over the horizon. And there's a very good reason for that. Yes, the orbit of the moon is a rather complicated thing to think about, actually. So I think we should use a diagram again and try to get to grips with some of the fundamental definitions. If we imagine we're in the center of this picture, looking at our horizon, we've got the north, east, east, south, and west points around the horizon. And it's very easy for us to set up a polar direction by watching the stars, the circumpolar stars, and so on. If then we imagine there's a line projected on the sky, which is at right angles to this axis, then of course that will give us the celestial equator, rising as it does in the east and setting exactly west, splitting the sky into two equal hemispheres. During a year, we follow the motion of the sun against the background stars. And at the moment, we've been following it, coming up to its highest altitude in the sky. We're almost on the summer solstice. And during this time, of course, the, the sun has moved to a point very high, well above the equator. 
and it rises well to the north of east, as you can see from this yellow curve, uh, on, well to the north of east rising, well to the north of west setting, so that it's above the horizon for a large number of hours during a summer day. During the winter, of course, the sun has crossed the equator, it's gone well below the equator, and we see it rising well to the south of east, not rising very high above the southern horizon, and setting well to the south of west. That is our annual cycle following the sun across the sky, the ecliptic, the path of the sun against the stars. The path of the moon is very close to the ecliptic, but it isn't the same. It's five degrees tilt between it and the ecliptic. So that at the moment, we're finding that the moon is very much higher than the sun, five degrees higher than the sun in the sky. And remember, the moon is only half a degree across, so that's quite a big angle in the sky. Here we see the moon rising to its highest point in the sky, and of course rising even further round to the north than the sun does, and setting even further to the north than the sun does. And we see it here covering a very high range of sky. But just two weeks later, it has sunk below the furthest point of the winter sun. And we see it five degrees below the southern sun point. And that gives us a range of sky which is truly enormous. The interesting point to make here is that the sun takes 12 months to make its cycle around the sky, whereas the moon does this every two, every four weeks, and it changes from high to low in just two weeks. But there is also this 18-year cycle of the lunar orbit. Yes. The orbit itself is spinning in a complicated way. It's due to a precessional effect. It's called the regression of the nodes. But what it means is that the orbit of the moon is itself spinning with a period of 18 years. This model, which is exaggerated, of course, shows you how the orbit spins like a top and changes its tilt. Sometimes the orbits, the orbital tilts add together, as now, and we get the very high moon and the very low moon. But in nine years' time, the, the orbits will be cancelling one another to a certain extent, and we'll get a very narrow swathe of sky covered by the moon. So it's quite complicated. But you know, Ron, it's rather amazing, isn't it, that the moon, I know, is something like a quarter of a million miles away, and that's not very far on the astronomical scale. But it's quite amazing that we can now measure its distance with modern equipment to less than an inch. Yes, using the laser reflecting techniques, uh, using mirrors that were put there by the Apollo astronauts, it's possible to measure changes in the distance of the moon down to a very small fraction of an inch. And that means, of course, that over the last few years we've logged up an enormous amount of data on how the moon moves. And it's become very complicated. There's precision in the data which we cannot yet explain. And, of course, it's due to interactions of things like Jupiter and the Sun and various other things that make it all a very complicated problem. And all these can now be taken into account. But there is just one other thing that I think we must mention briefly, even though we have mentioned it on the sky at night before, and that is the famous moon illusion. People tend to think that when the full moon is low down, it looks enormous, and artists ought to make it the size of a dinner plate, whereas when the moon's high up, it shrinks. But that doesn't actually happen. No, the moon on one particular night will change by a barely discernible amount. You'll need very sensitive equipment to pick it up. That's due to refraction in the atmosphere. The effect we've been talking about, about the changing apparent size of the moon, is due to its orbital motion. You need at least a month of observation to pick it up. You do indeed. Ron, thank you very much. So, you see, even though men have been to the moon, we've now surveyed the entire surface, and there's a great deal we know, there's still a great deal that we don't know. And although the moon may be a very junior member of the solar system, and totally insignificant in the universe as a whole, it is our faithful companion in space, and to us, it means a great deal. Good night. see that programme again on Saturday afternoon at 4.20 over on BBC Two.